Listener Rohan did just that about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder (ADHD), a well-recognised condition in children, but not in adulthood. Millions of adults, and that includes me, suffer a misery of ADHD. But trying to get actual treatment for it is proving to be really, really difficult. A lot of GPs I've spoken to don't acknowledge that the condition exists. I mean, I've I've suffered things like self-doubt, self-hate, depression. Even though I've got quite a high IQ, I've I've got a lot of skills. But at the age of 47, I'm a horrendous underachiever. And it's really difficult to to face the barriers that uh, the medical profession seems to put up. ADHD is something most children will never grow out of, so it's a little surprise that the latest estimates suggest that as many as 1 in 50 adults in the UK could have some degree of ADHD too, the vast majority of whom remain undiagnosed. Dr Jeff Cooley is a consultant paediatrician at the Learning Assessment and Neurosense Centre in Horsham, West Sussex. Prior to about 1990, ADHD was hardly recognised in children, let alone in adults. It was present, obviously, but it was often called other things, such as personality disorder or poor parenting and the like, so that it wasn't recognised and wasn't treated. And there's now a huge cohort of adults who have gone through life untreated. In many areas of the country, there is still a significant shortfall in service provision for adults. Hello, I'm Alan. I suffer from ADHD but I wasn't diagnosed until I was age 61. I'm now 67. The main characteristics I tend to have are severe memory problems. Not that it's not in my memory, but there's a great difficulty in getting things out, especially names. I also have a problem with procrastination. I start tasks, leave them, I forget. I also have a problem with uh, interrupting people behavioural problems. Some of the problems can be quite dangerous. I just didn't know what it was all about. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's me, Dr. Padat. You may or may not know me. You may be on the waiting list to see me, for which I apologise profusely. But in any case, Consultant psychiatrist Aves Badat is involved in a local support group and works at a specialist adult ADHD clinic in Bristol. Some of them have crazy risk-taking behaviours which just they are almost addicted to and one of the useful theories is people with ADHD if they lack dopamine this sort of excitatory hormone they're going to find it somewhere and what they tend to do is live on a brinksmanship kind of way so they drive in a really reckless way so people with ADHD tend to have a litany of driving offences that's at the lowest level the other thing was I guess they take risks in relationships they find themselves arguing and curiously almost spurred on by the argument and they can get moments of clarity and then regret what appears to be happening is they're actually exciting their own adrenals when you're in an anxious state and you have adhd what you get is a short burst of adrenaline which actually is a sort of body self-medication you get clarity so these people live on the edge because they're just using their own body or their own hormonal profile to treat themselves always catching themselves out in jobs, always seeking stimulation, unable to do mundane things because they're simply, they cannot commit their mind to those mundane things because there just isn't enough excitatory hormone to just get them through that. It sounds a dangerous recipe for, for, you know, if you're unlucky, you you get caught out at work, you get caught out in your relationship and you get caught out driving or breaking the law in other ways and you can end up in quite a lot of trouble. Indeed, you can. You get huge numbers of people in prison really unable to just stop themselves from saying or doing things out of turn and they're really embarrassed about it. This leads to all sorts of problems in their life. They can't hold down a job, their relationships fail, they also seek help for something which they don't know the shape of. Hello, my name's Jill. I'm Alan's partner of three years, although I have known him for about 15 years because we sing in the same choir. What I can't get over to him is... I know he's got it, I understand part of it, I'll never understand what's going on in his brain. He puts this barrier up and we always end up arguing. I lost a lot of friends. I gave up a lot of friends because I didn't feel I could be a true friend. I don't think I'm worthy of the friendship. You just get worn out mentally and physically sometimes you get worn out. I've got quite a good IQ and because of that I had a good education. Typically a picture is 
this child did very well at school and so well that they seem to never need to revise for exams. They were just extraordinarily bright. That's a particular subset we get. And then when they arrive at university, it just falls out and they just arrive with this serious sense that something has gone wrong. Clearly they haven't lost all their intelligence. They just can't coordinate their heads. And the analogy I sometimes use is that they feel as if they're at an airport which just has one plane landing a day, is able to cope. But suddenly they feel like an airport with air traffic control who have gone on strike and the planes, which are thoughts, if you like, are just landing in a chaotic way. They're landing anyway. Life moves on. You need to press on. But the place is a mess. And they feel, why can't I coordinate my own head? Because this concept of, a, of an adult presenting with ADHD being quite a high achiever, having a good school record, probably goes against the grain of what most doctors would think of, of an adult with undiagnosed ADHD. I mean, the stereotype might be of a child who's caused chaos throughout their school life but never been picked up and ends up in trouble as an adult and is quite a low achiever. But you're saying that that's not always the case? No, indeed not. I'm Susan and I'm 60. While I am hyperactive, I'm not really physically hyperactive, I'm mentally hyperactive. I change interests really fast. I have a lot to say, but I've only got one mouth, and it's really hard to get a lot of ideas that are buzzing around in my head at the same time out through one mouth. One of the worst impacts of not being diagnosed with this is that I have learned to be extremely cruel to myself and beat myself up all the time for making mistakes, for forgetting things, and for upsetting other people. In part, it's because I was diagnosed late and have very low self-esteem as a result, although I managed to hide that. But it means that I'm constantly doubting myself. The mainstay of therapy is treatment with the stimulant Ritalin, a drug that's attracted more than its fair share of controversy over the years. The medication, mostly, broadly speaking, is uh, the first line is, is stimulant medication. What it appears to do is increase something called dopamine and noradrenaline. These are sort of transmitters in the brain. What these things, these chemicals appear to do is allow the brain to be more adept at choosing what to focus on and not, not to focus on, so you don't get this mental noise so much. So here you have these people who are normally hyperactive, physically just cannot get it together. They suddenly get the ability to pick one thing nicely and see it through to the end without this sense that it's either going to be abandoned or incomplete. So paradoxically, you're, you're giving them effectively a stimulant, but that stimulant works by improving the clarity. Absolutely. And one of the best things I've seen is a patient who has a habit for sports cars who says, Doc, for the first time after medication, I can drive my fast car slowly. And it was a relief to him, which is a paradox. The only way I can describe it is that it's like putting on my glasses. I take the medication and half an hour later, I can see. I know where I'm going, what I'm doing during the day, and I get things done. When I don't take the medication, I just get lost. A whole day goes by and I've done nothing but think thoughts. I've had ideas of things to do. I haven't done any of them. And it is really, really distressing not to be able to get things done. And it's the only way I've been able to hold down the jobs, the large number of jobs I've had, but the only way I've been able to do it, the only way I've been able to finish university I could not have done that without the medication. People come back and say, where have I been my whole life? It is as transformational as that. It is probably one of the most effective medicines in psychiatry. But our listener says he's struggling to get the help that he needs. And I suspect that's quite a familiar problem across the country. Yes, it's, it's, it's a cross that uh, people have to bear when they have a disorder which isn't well recognised and which is controversial even in, in professional circles. GPs sometimes just simply don't uh, think it's there, they think it's a societal construct. Are we making progress? Absolutely. I think there's a large amount of activism when it comes to ADHD, partly driven by patients who are so consciously positively enraged by the fact that it took so long for them to get diagnosed. And of course, a lot of them are very able, very high achievers, just like people with autism, who then are campaigning. These are people who are saying, why isn't there enough service? Why is there such a big waiting list? I was diagnosed about 10 years ago in America when I was at university. Then I came back to England, and naturally the NHS wouldn't take an American diagnosis, which was fair enough. So I thought, well, I'll just um, go to the GP and ask for a referral. 
Well, that turned into a huge problem. The partners of the GP practice didn't believe in ADHD and didn't want to refer me. So I had to get my MP involved. One of the criticisms has, has been that this is, you know, the, is the, the medical creep is, is the term that, that's used and that drug companies are getting in on, you know, well, we've got a product here, what are we going to do with it? Oh, I know, it, it works for this condition. So if we can medicalise basically an extension or a malady. But what would you say to people who argue that? Absolutely. I think uh, it's, it's a debate that is absolutely valid. I don't think anyone should take anything at face value. ADHD is a disorder which is neurodevelopmental and a lot of it means it's so intertwined with elements of personality that you can't just say this is disorder and this isn't. So the rounded understanding that I need to develop takes necessarily long for something that superficially looks exceptionally easy. Here's 18 criteria, do you tick the boxes? So we do get, therefore, the controversy of why are you taking so long for something that somebody might be able to self-diagnose on, online. The key is actually, it's everything else I need to rule out. My name's James. Uh, I am in my late 30s. I was diagnosed with ADHD just over a year ago. When you meet other people who've got it, you suddenly feel human again because they have so many of the same characteristics that you do. And I think once you know you've got it, it isn't the end of the world because it comes with good things as well as bad. What does the damage is not the fact you've got the thing, it's not knowing about it, because not knowing about it, it can absolutely destroy you. The big thing is that there's hope that the future can be better than the past. One of the members of the adult ADHD self-help group in Bristol.